I'm sure you've blown into a bottle before, right? Like, this. Now, if I pour some water into that bottle, the pitch changes. Like this, it gets higher because there's less space for the air to resonate in. It's the same with our vocal tract. If we have more space with a low larynx and a lifted soft palate and all that, it sounds darker because lower overtones are being amplified. And if we make it very small by raising the larynx, spreading the mouth, all these things, it sounds brighter because higher overtones are amplified. All of them are there all the time, but some are louder and others are dampened. Now, this is probably not super new to you and it's still pretty abstract in general, but if we are super precise with which exact pitches we amplify by shaping our vocal tract, making it bigger or smaller in certain ways, we can actually track certain overtones or harmonics. So the first overtone is one octave above my fundamental pitch, the one that I'm singing. So if I'm singing hmm, this pitch, but I'm doing it on a yelly, whoa, then the first overtone, second harmonic, is particularly strong in that. It gives it that boosty kind of whoa overdrive character. So oh, on that pitch, it's just the oh that works perfectly. And if I want to take it lower, I have to close the mouth from oh to oh. And if I want to take it higher, I have to open the mouth from oh to uh. All of that is described as CVT's O oh vowel, but you might notice that if you want to stay in overdrive, you have to increase the bite and make the lips more spread. And, you know, raising the larynx also helps. It's kind of like when you inhale helium, your voice doesn't actually get higher. It's not like it's, you know, changing the pitch, but it just gets much brighter and sounds like a chipmunk. Um, and we are kind of doing a bit of that when we are raising the larynx. Ah! in order to belt. We do all these things to track overtones with our formants. Oh, and formant is just an older word for vocal tract resonance. There are several vocal tract resonances, but the first two are most important for the recognition of vowels. The first one is to simplify it a lot, the resonance of our throat. And the second one is also very simplified, the resonance of our mouth. Um, it's not that easy actually because the first formant also changes by opening and closing the mouth. So a more open mouth ah, will have an open sound and a more closed mouth. So either ooh or e will have a low first formant or vocal tract resonance. And then how bright we make something is basically our second vocal tract resonance. Ooh is closed but very dark and e is closed but very bright. Ooh, ee, ooh. And then you might have heard about the singer's formant or formant cluster. It's basically the same that classical singers talk about when they say squeal or ring. When we have a metallic quality like edge mode, there is that very, very bright buzzing sound, which is a clustering of the third, fourth and fifth vocal track resonances. We basically get it by narrowing the space above our vocal folds a lot. And uh, those formants come very close to each other, so they amplify each other and very high overtones of the pitch that we're singing. And it's just, you know, this very silvery or at times harsh, nasty quality. Basically, vocal tract resonances or formants are what make our pitches beautiful or ugly sounds. The tuning of the first vocal tract resonance to the first overtone or second harmonic that I described is only one way of form and tuning. It's the one we use in overdrive. Whoa, hey, and in some edge, hey, like this. But we could also tune the first vocal track resonance to our fundamental pitch, our first harmonic, which we do in classical soprano singing. This is called whoop timbre for obvious reasons. You might also intuitively do it at a concert. And this, again, gives you a very loud and projecting sound because it's just the most efficient way. You don't have to push a lot, you just 
find the right mouth shape and the right larynx position to be loud. If your first vocal track resonance is not exactly synchronizing with one of your harmonics, but it's in between of the first and second harmonic, we speak of closed timbre. It's more closed than the yelly thing that we have in overdrive, but it's also not whoopy yet. It will sound more like ah, this kind of covered. We might start in yell timbre and then go higher without opening our mouth more. So it will close, it will turn over. That's what you perceive it as. Whoa! Like this. This is kind of what classical tennis do also for. Yeah! Right? You can also tune your second vocal track resonance to higher overtones to make it very ringy. For example, when I sing it's that pitch that I amplify with my vocal tract. And if I detune it, it will still be an eval, but it will be slightly darker and maybe less projecting. Sounds cool too, but doesn't carry that much. That is a second form and strategy, so to say. And then finally, if we don't have any vocal track resonance amplifying a certain harmonic, for example, if the first vocal track resonance is below our pitch because we're too high, it's nil timbre. Like this. As you can hear, it's a very fluty tone. Some people might call it super head voice or flagellate. It's very important to me, though, to say that this is not whistle register, because whistle is a different mechanism where only a part of the length of the vocal folds are vibrating, whereas this is just a variation of falsetto with the acoustic circumstances that I've described. If you want to get really nerdy about it, you can get several breaks within the falsetto mechanism just because of acoustics. Let's see what we can get. Ow! So now it was breaking from open timbre falsetto to closed timbre falsetto because it was kind of skipping yell timbre as that one isn't really a very stable pressure balance in that falsetto range. Then there was another flip where my first formant locked into whoop timbre. Then a flip where my first formant lost whoop timbre but my second formant, which is very close to the first formant on that uval, took over the job of the first formant and locked into a kind of pseudo whoop timbre. And then finally there was that crack into nil timbre, where it lost all lower formant amplification. Now, why would you do that though? <laughs> it didn't really sound good. But what it does is it gives us important information. Even if your goal is to have a very smooth transition through the different acoustic registers, provoking some of these breaks by holding on to one timbre a bit longer than it would be efficient might be very helpful because it tells you what not to do in order to disguise those transitions. And even if some of that might have gone over your head, it is incredibly helpful to be aware of those different timbres. Like even just the placement sensations that they give you in singing. It's just a realization that there are some vocal track shapes that work better at a given range and volume, and some that don't really work as well for the sound you want to achieve. And once you've found just that handful of different pathways and strategies that suit your voice and the music you want to sing best, you can become a very versatile and nuanced singer instead of just trying to get through every song in that one sound that your choir leader might have told you to stick to because it's the path of least resistance. <laughs> just start experimenting with your voice a bit and you will quickly find ways to do many different sounds more and more efficiently.